Hello, everyone. Well, I'll wait until you get that going. There we go. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, as a reminder, this is an informational webinar on uh, AmeriCorps and C, how we work nationally, uh, what we do, and how you can partner with us in the Southwest region. Um, and again, looks like there are a lot of folks from outside of the region, but we'd be happy to connect you with our counterparts um, across the country uh, at the end of this call. Next slide, please. Uh, so we are the National Civilian Community Corps, which is one of the four streams of AmeriCorps. Um, the others are AmeriCorps VISTA, AmeriCorps State National, and AmeriCorps Seniors. Um, frequently, we just uh, use the acronym NCCC uh, and pronounce it NCCC. Um, this is a callback to uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps um, that was started by FDR um, that was often called the C. We have um, a two-pronged mission, and it's to strengthen communities and develop leaders through team-based national and community service. So one aspect is to work with you all and to uh, meet the needs of your community and make your communities safer, smarter, and healthier. But the second part of our mission is to develop our, our um, members uh, as leaders in their, um, in their communities. Next slide, please. So to talk a little bit um, about our members, our members are young adults. They're aged 18 to 26. Um, it used to be 18 to 24, but um, the CARES Act allowed um, that age range to go up to 26 to allow more members uh, to serve if they had to sit out during the pandemic. Um, we are hopeful right now to get that um, age range uh, permanently, 18 to 26, um, if the CARES Act um, lapses, which it will soon, um, and we don't get that extended, it will go back down to 24, but we're hoping to, to get it um, permanently in statute at 26. We are a full-time uh, program, and members serve for 10 to 12 months. Um, so they will uh, start their training by coming to uh, one of those four campuses. Um, they'll do training for about a month, and then they will go out into the field, um, come to you all, and work on projects that you have for the remaining um, 10 to 11 months. It is a team-based program. Uh, so members are assigned to a team of 8 to 10 or 8 to 12 members with one team leader. They will work together, they will live together, they will travel together, um, they'll be one unit. So they'll all come, in our case, they'll all come to Denver, get assigned to a team, and then they will go out um, on their projects as a team, live together as a team, um, work together as a team. And as I mentioned before, um, they are assigned to one of four campuses. Um, they typically have around three to six service projects in a year. So as we'll talk about in a little bit, um, projects can range anywhere from three to 12 weeks. Um, and we have project cycles that go throughout the year um, that you can apply to. And um, though they serve for 10 months, you would probably be getting the team anywhere um, for, for three to 12 weeks. Next slide, please. So some of the benefits, uh, why, why might a young adult choose to do this program? Well, they, they do have some benefits in the program. Um, it helps build their resume. They can get valuable experience working with you all, um, doing it whatever it is you do, whether that's um, environmental stewardship or food security or affordable housing um, or education. They get to travel the country. This is a really cool way um, for them to to see a new part of the country that they may never have been to. Um, their expenses are taken care of in the program, so it's a really feasible way for them to see more of the country. Um, they get to earn an education award. So if they successfully complete the, the 10 months, um, they will get uh, an education award that they can use for future schooling or to pay back student loans. Um, right now, I think it's about $6,800. So that number has gone up. It's tied to the Pell Grant. Um, and anytime the Pell Grant goes up, um, that, that education award goes up as well. They do receive a small living allowance. Um, so every two weeks they get 
think it's maybe a hundred dollars or you know a couple hundred dollars. Um, it's not not very much, um, but it is a chance for them to either save or um, spend money um, in the program and, and go out to eat and do some of the things that your communities offer. Their expenses are covered in the program. Um, we provide them with money for transportation and money for food and laundry. Um, you will provide the housing for them in the process, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and then some of their um, medical expenses are covered as well. And then lastly, uh, they get to make a difference. So they get to leave their mark on communities that they serve uh, and feel that they are a part of uh, the, the long story history of national service, which we are coming up on the 30th year of. Next slide, please. So some eligible sponsors. Uh, we are a federal program, and as such, we can only work with um, certain organizations, but thankfully that list is, is quite extensive. Um, so on this screen, you'll see uh, local governments, you'll see state governments, and you'll see federal governments. So we can work with, as a federal partner, we can work with any other um, form of government in the country. Um, typically, we work with nonprofits. Um, so anything that's not not for profit, um, be that secular or faith based, we can work with. Uh, we can work with any institution of education, be that um, anything from an early childhood education center all the way up to, to higher ed um, and a university or college. Um, we can work with any public lands, um, be that national, state, um, or even local public lands. And then we can work with the tribes uh, in the country. So pretty much the only, the only organizations we can't work with are for-profit um, agencies. Um, so we want to make sure that the members are doing a public good. Uh, they're spending their time improving communities, making them safer, smarter, healthier um, through an organization whose mission is the same. Next slide, please. All right, um, so we're going to talk about the type of work that we do in the program. Um, we have five different focus areas um, that a project can fall under. And sometimes projects, um, you your organizations do multiple of these things, and that's totally OK as well. Um, the members can serve on a project that encompasses um, or moves between these focus areas. But these are how we uh, quantify the work that we do when we make our reports. Um, we put them into these five buckets. So the first is natural and other disasters. Uh, some examples of this are filling and installing sandbags for local communities to mitigate the impacts of a natural disaster. Um, but this can be anything from prepar or preparation and mitigation all the way to uh, response and recovery. Anywhere in the disaster cycle, we can typically be involved. Um, we send teams immediately after events, and we also send teams. Um, we're still sending teams to Houston uh, and Texas for Hurricane Harvey. So um, we're there usually long after. So the cameras have gone away. Um, we can do anything from working in, in donation centers to, to rebuilding homes. The next is infrastructure improvement. So a lot of this relates to um, sort of public uh, publicly owned infrastructure and, and lands. Um, some examples of this could be building ramps or footbridges to in increase community accessibility in a park, um, but anything um, that would help make, um, yeah, sort of publicly owned facilities uh, better, uh, we, can, we can work on that. The next is urban and rural development. This is perhaps our biggest bucket. Um, the example here is to construct and rehabilitate low income housing, but it encompasses so much more than just housing. Um, all of our education priorities fit in here. All of our food securities priorities fit in here. Um, anything that makes the lives of citizens in your community a better place, um, lifts them out of poverty, uh, helps with um, like I said, local food, food access and access to healthy food, access to education, uh, anything that makes their, their sort of day-to-day -day life better um, would fall under urban and rural development. The next bucket is environmental stewardship and conservation. And the example we have here is uh, constructing and repairing hiking trails in local and national parks across the country. Um, but it 
it encompasses pretty much anything um, that that you could that you do. I see a lot of people on, on the Forest Service here, um, whether that's protecting rivers, um, doing fire mitigation, um, removing invasive species, um, any anything that that falls into a public good um, for environmental stewardship and conservation, we are able uh, to put members on. And then the last. Um, bucket that we have is energy conservation. And the uh, example here is to educate communities on sustainability and energy use best practices, but this can encompass doing weatherization um, for low income individuals to reduce their energy bills. It can be uh, working on sort of public um, or uh, low income solar. Um, if that's done through a nonprofit, um, there are lots of lots of things that can fall under energy conservation. Um, and we're we're always trying to look for for new ways as as um, trends uh, move towards clean energy. We're trying to um, be able to put our teams on more of those projects. I will pause um, before the next slide since I've gone through a lot of information to see if there are any questions. And feel free either to put anything in the chat um, or to come off mute. OK, I'm not seeing anything this moment, but um, please feel free if at any point you have any questions to, to um, put that in the chat and we'll do our best to address it. Next slide, please. So these are the things that we bring to the project. Um, we bring uh, a team leader to each team, so that member um, joins uh, with us a little bit earlier before the year starts and they go through uh, additional training on uh, team management, uh, team building, um, discipline, um, how to effectively manage a team of eight to 12 young adults. They will be the main point of contact for you um, on the project and you will work with them weekly to talk about schedule, how the project's going, um, what challenges you're having and, and how to keep the, the pro project on track. We also provide a 15 passenger uh, van for the team. Um, this gets them from Denver to uh, your community, but it also gets them around the project. We also provide um, the fuel costs as well. Um, so transportation is, is taken care of. We provide them with enough funds for the team to cook meals together. So they get a small uh, food stipend. It's about 610 per member per day right now. So um, that, that might not sound like a lot, but it can um, cover the team's needs when they shop together uh, in bulk and, and cook meals together. We provide them some basic PPE, uh, including hard hat, gloves, eye pro, ear pro, uh, masks, hand sanitizer, um, and a uniform, which you see in some of these photos as well. The members are covered uh, by the Federal Torts Claim Act uh, and FECA, which is uh, something very close to workers' comp. Um, and the Torts Claim Act um, helps protect you if uh, the team damages any equipment or property while they're there. And then all members, uh, in order to be eligible to be in the program, they pass uh, an FBI background check and they go through the National Sex Offenders check as well. So you can rest assured knowing that everybody th that would come uh, on the team has already gone through um, a three point background check. Um, and uh, if, especially if you serve with a vulnerable population, uh, our members are covered. And I will turn it over to you, Nicole. Thanks again. And if there's any questions, um, I'll switch over to chat duty. So, Nicole, you can get started and I can answer the question that just came in. Wonderful. Sounds good. And I know we've had a few folks join um, a little later than we started. This is being recorded, so we'll be sure to share this out um, if you are in, unable to join us right away. So no worries there. And if you have colleagues who were unable to make it again, we'll, we'll share that recording out to you all. All right, so the responsibilities of the sponsoring organization. So we refer to you all as the sponsors, just that's kind of our jar jargon, but this partnership that we have. So what are our, our expectations? First is training. 
So these are young adults who have varied life lived experiences and skills and understanding. So we really we ask for training so they are good stewards of your resources and time, uh, but also to get that training and ensure that they're being safe as well. So particularly when you're thinking about power tools, right, chainsaw, we want to ensure that the team is being safe with your resources and then using them properly. Tools and equipment, so we do ask for the sponsors to provide the, supp the supplies necessary in order to complete the project, right? So if you're working on a home construction project, the spot we expect that the sponsor will provide the supplies needed to get that done, right? Um, and for tools as well, so we do, as Brian noted, um, we have a basic uh, supply of tools, um, but uh, we really do ask that kind of those tools that are are detailed and specific to those projects are provided for the team. Full time service. So this is something that we always highlight and underscore. Is that these core members are expected to work a full time job essentially as as part of uh, being a part of the NCCC. So this means that they work 40 hours a week. Uh, so we always want to be very clear because it's a group of young adults who have a lot of energy and they can get a lot done. So thinking of your week and really planning that out and have a solid work plan to ensure that they get those hours necessary. And we highlight that because, as Brian noted, they get an education award at the end of their service, and that is contingent on them completing those hours. So we really want those full time 40 hours a week of meaningful and engaged service for them. We want supervision, so we want direct supervision for the team. Again, these are young adults who are eager to learn, eager to gain skills and eager to do those projects well, so that requires that supervision. We do ask for at least 20 hours of direct supervision, but we do prefer more on-site direct supervision, particularly if there's anything, again, with power tools or chainsaws, we need someone on the ground working with them and supporting them to ensure everyone is safe. Orientation, uh, these again, these core members are traveling across the country. They will be new to your community, new to your organization. And so really having that orientation to help them understand the context of the community, the context of the project and the why of it all, and also to understand and get to know the staff members they will be interacting with and any rules and regulations that you all expect of the team. And then housing. We do expect our sponsors to provide housing for our teams. And so again, our, 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 our teams range from anywhere from eight to 12 members. So what this looks like is some sort of sleeping quarters, access to a kitchen and access to showers and bathrooms, so a full bathroom, if you will. Now, I will say our teams are certainly not expecting a five-star hotel. Our, our sponsors has been very creative and how housing looks. Um, and so things like places of faith basements, which may be a church basement, sometimes they connect with a local higher education institution and stay at dorms, maybe there's volunteer housing cabins. So we'll be happy to brainstorm some um, housing ideas, but we do expect our sponsors to provide housing for our teams during the time that they're they're with you all. So. If this sounds interesting, how do you get a team, right? So we're going to be talking a little bit about our deadlines and just a few slides from here. But the first step is this project concept form. So this uh, this concept form is if you're very if you're familiar with grant writing, which I'm sure many of you are, it's like a letter of intent. It's a brief idea of what is the need of this project? What would the team be doing and what are um, what are your ideas and plans for housing? It's very brief. We look that over as APDs and then we'll invite you to apply. OK, so concept form is more general, brief, right? And then the application is a little more meat, a little meatier, more detailed. And that's what we'll look for more of those work plans, those orientation plans. What does training look like? And I guess just gets more into those details, right? Um, once we look at the, the, those applications, we present to our leadership. We set a docket or we 
choose the projects we're going to go with right for each round. And again, we're going to talk about those little deadlines and a few slides from here. So once a project is approved, we'll connect with you. Um, sometimes it's necessary for a pre-site visit, and that means that myself and my colleagues will come out and visit you all, um, particularly if you are a new sponsor or we haven't partnered with you in three plus years. We come out, we visit with you, we take a tour of the facilities and get a really understanding of what that project looks like on an in-person basis. After that, we um, we do a conference call. Um, so this will be like the handoff call with the team. So you get to meet the team. Any last minute questions will be addressed before they deploy. And then we have some fun paperwork at the end that we'll send you all. So as you look at the screen, the red is kind of the more administrative pieces when the team is not on the ground. And that's when you will be mostly working with the APDs. The blue is when the team is on the ground. So after the sponsor agreement is signed, we have that handoff call, everything's good to go. The team will arrive, they'll work with you, they'll get that all that great work done. They'll come back to us here in Denver, Colorado. We'll send you uh, a, a project completion report throughout the time the team is with you all. They are collecting data every single week, both quantitative and qualitative data. They summarize that, and we provide that to you at the end of the service. OK, so that's what's called a project completion report, and we also will send out a sponsor survey just to learn more about what your experience was, and we'll also follow up just to have a conversation again, just to see what your experience was with our NCCC team. So it does take time. This is quite the cycle, so um, it, it roughly takes around 45 months between the application to project start. Um, Again, there are a couple cycles and rounds that we'll talk about, but again, that first start is that concept form. OK, and throughout this process, Brian, Kat and I are here to support you with and address any questions that you may have about the application, um, how to strengthen your application and just brainstorm some ideas. So uh, this is hot off the presses and we'll be sending this out to you all too. Uh, so this is our service timeline for this upcoming 30 a year. Uh, so our next round of service. So we we break down, I should back up. We break down our year service into three rounds, okay? So the first round that's available to apply to is November to December. So this is November 3rd to December 17th. The concept form, that first step, is due June 20, uh, 16th, June 16th. The application is due August 11th. And then we'll let you all know and notify you of your status September 11th, OK? The second round is January 5th to April 7th. Concept form, September 1st. Application is due October 13th. We'll notify. November 13th. Last round is April 12th to July 14th. The concept form is due December 15th. The application is due February 2nd and will notify everyone March 4th. Now, if you are looking at these dates and I will say A, if you are not um, from our states, from Southwest, these dates are going to look different. Um, for every region. So I just want to note that out. And again, we'll be happy to connect you uh, to the folks outside of our region. Um, but if you're looking on these dates and you think, huh, well, I know I don't know if I can have a, I, I don't know if I have enough work for 13 weeks, right? Because that's a that's a good chunk of time. There's a lot of different iterations of what these projects could look like. So one step is to say, you know, maybe we can take a team for six weeks, right? So on your concept form, you can adjust these dates. And but we do ask that it kind of bookends the beginning or end of it. So what I mean by that is say, if you're looking at the third round, maybe you take a team from April 12th to, I don't know, May 8th or, or yeah sometime in May, right? Or maybe you start in May and can take them all the way to July 14th. So as that kind of bookends our beginning and start dates, we can be flexible. We also encourage uh, co-sponsorships too. So maybe if you are 
a nonprofit um, and have other nonprofit or partners in your area that you want to connect with and put in the application together. That's also a way to kind of bulk up that work plan and work together. And it's a really dynamic project also for the team. So again, we'll, we can, we're here to brainstorm some of those ideas, but just wanted to point that out as you're looking at these different service ranges that there's different ways to go about this, okay? So the tips of the concept form. So for the concept form, we do provide instructions on how to fill it out. So please take the time just to review those instructions uh, for each narrative. So it's it's not very lengthy, I would say, but again, we really pretend that we don't know anything about, about you all, right? So we're maybe just learning about your organization for the very first time. Um, so that's a very good tip of just understanding what the need is, right? What the project could be. Um, and all those details would really be helpful in providing, providing that and painting that picture for us. So um, again, we'll review it and then that's when we will invite you to apply if everything looks good to go. And again, we'll have those conversations throughout this process. And if you are, maybe you, you do have other partners that you want to connect with and submit a concept for and a project together. Um, please share their information as well and provide, you know, their their mission, their needs too, because we want to understand the full scope of that project. So as far as the application process itself, uh, I think something that's helpful is, you know, some of those questions that we ask are around around need, around the mission, around even maybe to this a certain extent that the project, right? If you have a like good good healthy volunteer bank, maybe you have information within your own documents, within your own history that you can pull from, right, to make the application process easier, right? So uh we won't knock you down for plagiarism, so to speak. So you don't have to cite your sources. Uh so if you have information, feel free to copy and paste like your mission statement, all those key pieces into the application as long as it's addressing those questions and it's very catered to that project, right? Um, so when thinking about the community need piece, we want to see how the NCCC team fits into that picture, right? So not just the over the overall need of your organization is great, but how in particular the team fits into that picture, okay? And please highlight if your narrative or the project is time sensitive. So particularly our disaster folks, uh, maybe it is prevention, right? So if you do have a fire break, for example, that you would really like to be built in order to avoid fires in the future, please note that in the application materials and we'll, you know, we'll see that and really understand, again, the context of the project and that time sensitive piece. Project design overview and tip. So again, assume the reader, us, we don't know anything about the projects and the tasks that are being requested, right? So if you are thinking about maybe trail building or home construction or working at a food bank, right? What does that look like? What would the team actually be doing, right? So are they interacting with the clientele? Are they just sorting? Um, are they driving to different places for uh, for distribution sites? Um, any any of that information and context we we need to know so we understand and have can have those targeted conversations or follow up questions about safety and and um, again just have that clear picture and yeah when in doubt just provide more detail than you think necessary right so if you're talking about home construction uh, and you think yeah these APDs we should know what home construction looks like that could be true but please just provide as much information right like anything if they're working with mold for example we like to know um, if they're working with scaffolding or ladders or any tool use any of those pieces we really appreciate that clear picture so lodging overview and tips so uh you know there for both the concept form and the application is a housing portion and Again, just provide as many details as as you 
as you can, right? So what does the, when you say kitchenette, for example, or kitchen, what is provided? Is the stove provided? Is there a microwave or there's a toaster oven, right? Is there a, a coffee pot for our team? Are there more than one full bathrooms? What is the bathroom situation? What what are the bedrooms like, right? Are cots needed? So maybe if there's no mattresses, we can provide cots, for example, but all those things really help us to understand what the housing situation looks like, right? Are there are keys to the doors that the team can have, right? Are there access codes? Are there, maybe if it is in a kind of more community center type piece, are there any rules around communal spaces that you want the team to know of or we to know of? Um, are there any expectations the team moves their belongings at any point? Is there parking for our giant 15 passenger van? All of these things really, really help us, again, just paint that, that clear picture, right? Um, and does so a frequently asked question that we get does lodging need to be move in ready so you are responsible for confirming housing is fully prepared for the team so that includes ensuring that the housing is clean before before the team is uh arrives right so um depending on what the housing is just ensuring that all the prop you know the places are cleaned and ready thinking about the team experience these are young adults who are dedicating a year of their you know, lives to to work with different communities. And we just always really appreciate any way to support our, our members and their experience. Um, and if housing is being improved, right, please just indicate that when that would be completed. Maybe you all plan to install a stove, maybe you all in, uh, plan to install um, air conditioning or heat. Um, so just please note that and share where you all are in that progress. So um, with in regards to COVID, so of course, this is a situation that we're still navigating. So all of our core members, first, they are tested when they um, arrive with us, and we often do testing when they're stopping by our campus between different projects. So all of our um, <clears throat> core members um, are fully vaccinated. So we do want to share that. Um, and. And I want to say too that we cannot share it because there are some small percentage of core members that might have an exemption. Um, I know when we had connected with our health services unit, it is very small. I want to say it's in the high 90s of our core members who are vaccinated. Um, so the threshold of that exemption seems to be quite high. Um, we can share if a team is fully vaccinated or not fully vaccinated with sponsors, but we can't provide who is who. So just wanted to note that. Um, and with COVID too, what we're still seeing, we still have some checklists and guidelines for our sponsors as far as housing and um, on the on the work site itself, we'll be happy to share them out. Um, we, you know, we're still holding on to those those guidelines that we have currently, and certainly if there's any updates to those guidelines, we'll let you know. All right, so what questions do you all have? Please feel free. Uh, this is um, kind of our first dive into webinar land. Um, so please feel free to enter questions into the chat or um, I can see if maybe if you raise your hand and I can unmute you, but no promises. But let's let's see if we can answer any questions in the chat. And Brian, do are there any that you want to highlight for the crew, or is there anything I missed in my presentation you'd like to add? Um, I, I think I've answered the ones uh, in the chat so far, except for the last one from Scott. So maybe I can just answer it verbally. Um, Scott, the the COVID policy had been that there was only one member per bed, um, but those are lifting. And so I need to check with you. That said, we can um, we can have you know as many people as is reasonable in one room. Um, it doesn't need to be lux. Like they don't need doesn't need to be a room per member. Um, you know, if the hotel or motel is okay with it, we can put multiple members in a room, uh, include rollout beds. We have our own cots that we could supply um, if it needs to be like 
you know, a member per bed. Um, but, you know, we want to make sure that that you all can um, house the, the team and not not have it be too big of an impact on your budget. So um, there is the possibility of having, you know, multiple multiple members per room. And then, um, Nicole, it looks like you're getting a question to, to maybe just broadcast the project round dates. Yes, and I'm going to pull up that slide again, so just bear with me. I know I'm a visual person, so. Okay, so these service dates again, the rounds. Uh, so round one is November 3rd to December 17th. That concept form is due June 16th, application August 11th. Round two, January 5th to April 7th. Concept form due September 1st. October 13th is the application deadline. April 12th to July 14th is round three. That concept form is due December 15th. And then the application deadline is due February 2nd. It also should be noted that this is just for our region. So our mm -hmm. nine state region in, in the Southwest, which again is Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, Kansas, Texas, Oklahoma, Missouri, and Arkansas. If you are in another state on this call, um, there are different um, project cycles um, in, in each of your corresponding regions. And um, I'm going to put my, my email here in the chat. Um, just email me um, if, if you want to know or be connected to uh, the folks in your region, and I'd be happy to do that. Jean, you asked a question, um, and I just um, was curious where you are uh, joining us from. Arizona, great. So yes, Jean, the, these dates would apply to you. Wonderful. I'll take Kelly's. Okay. Uh, if a project is awarded based on one of those award dates, will they have a specific time frame for the given project? Um, we try to give you what you apply for. So I think I'm understanding the question correct, Kelly, but if I'm not, please let me know. Um, if you apply for the full, you know, 12 to 13 weeks, you apply for this. It looks like you're, you're, joining us from Vermont, so these probably aren't applicable to you, but I'll use them as an example um, that if if you apply for April 12th to July 14th, we try our hardest to, to get you those dates. Um, but sometimes based on number of applicants or, um, you know, just sort of what the applicant pool is looking like, we may um, have to uh, adjust the dates and we can give like partial awards as well. But um, typically we, we try to to keep you to the dates that you apply for. Uh, Gary, you've asked the same question as Scott with respect to lodging. Um, what was the pre-COVID max per room? It, again, there's not, uh, if it's a hotel room, I guess it would depend on uh, the hotel and the policy and like the space in the room. Um, we are, we're personally um, and organizationally comfortable with whatever the like guidelines or limits of the hotel room are. So we wouldn't want to like put eight people in a room if the hotel or motel wasn't okay with that. But if the hotel is is okay with people, we would just want it, you know, we wouldn't want them packed in <laughs> um, and just sort of all stacked along next to each other. But um, you could certainly fit in, you know, think, think, People on cots sort of in a um, maybe a disaster situation or a shelter operation, you know, you give them. Three feet of space or something like that, so but it would depend on on the room size, so I don't know if I can say. We don't we don't have like a max per room necessarily. Okay. 
Um, it looks like we have a question from Scott, uh, the main cipher in triple C, then being from the Eastern region. Um, so with those states listed, um, you will be working with the North Central region um, that is based out of um, Benton, Iowa. Uh, so we have four campuses across our country. So of course we were located in Denver, Colorado. There is also a campus in Mississippi um, and then in California as well to represent either the Southern region or the Pacific region. Um, of course we do have some headquarters people that are technically connected to DC, but most of the time you all will be working with your region. Uh, for organizations submitting the uh, June 16th concept form, how quickly will they find out if they are moving on uh, to the full application? So the concept form, great question. Thank you, Danny. Uh, the concept form piece is a bit more of a rolling process. So say if you have a great idea right now and you want to submit something to, to us before that deadline. Um, we can let you know. We'll, we'll review that concept form and, you know, if there's anything like, oh, I just need more information, we'll follow up with you about that. And then, um, but if it looks solid, if it looks like it's an appropriate project for a team, we'll invite you to apply. So it's more of on a rolling basis. Um, but that 16th is that that deadline for that. So, and we do try to like say, if you do turn in a concept form on the 16th, uh, we try to get everyone an answer within the following week. Uh, just so you have that month to really, um, you know, do the application and submit all the pieces that you need. Great question. So uh, Scott asks, um, assuming that lodging means indoors, no camping outside. So this is like a, an evolving piece. So we have done camping projects in the past. Um, we do ask that there is, of course, access to showers, right? Access to a kitchen. Um, laundry is a bonus, but it's not necessary, but it's really those pieces. And if there is a plan, say if there's inclement weather, whether it's too cold or thunderstorm, tornado, of course, um, if there is a facility or some sort of structure that the team can use for those instances that they can sleep in. Um, I will say with COVID, we kind of have stepped out of that, but it seems more and more camping projects are coming up. Again, it's something we can definitely explore. Uh, one thing that we are holding on to as far as our current guidelines, so as the current housing guidelines, we do ask for an isolation and quarantine space for our sponsors. And so that does mean a sleeping quarters and full um, full bathroom. So uh, sometimes we've seen with maybe camp projects that there's maybe a nurse's station that have, you know, has space for people to sleep in um, and shower facilities that they could use. Um, but just want to share that kind of like tricky point on camping projects. Brian, is there anything that comes to mind? I know you're an alum too, so maybe you've had experiences camping. Yeah, the only thing that I would say too is just think about um, the environment. Like if, if it's going to be um, elevation or it, uh, if you're more northern and depending on the time of year, um, we have some camping supplies, but we don't have, you know, a force. We don't have like a bunch of four season tents. So um, we would we would evaluate um, the, the weather circumstances and or ask you to provide um, necessary supplies if the weather was um, going to be colder, probably. And this is sort of on the same thread, but I, I just want to share this because I think it's pretty helpful. Some sponsors have used or rented uh, shower trailers uh, to help with their housing needs. So say maybe you have a space and they have bathrooms, but no showers, they'll rent shower trailers that maybe have like three stall, stalls, so to speak. Um, so that's a, I don't know, I thought that was a really inventive way that sponsors have provided housing in the past. So I just wanted to share that tip.
Wonderful. Are there any burning questions that come up? Oh, that's great to hear. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it really is a wonderful opportunity for the core members and for you all just to interact and um, they're eager to know you all and get to know all the partners and the community leaders. And uh, so it's a really wonderful way to connect and learn with people. So it's wonderful to hear. And again, folks, for, for people who are maybe outside of our region, we will uh, We'll be happy to connect you with our colleagues uh, and all the information is the same except for those deadlines so yeah scott we'll um we'll send out this recording as soon as we have it available all right last question our last call for questions before we wrap this up Thank you. Well, thank you all so, so very much. We really appreciate these partnerships that we have with you all. Please feel free to reach out to us with any questions, any follow up questions. If you live outside of our region, we're happy to connect you again. Uh, feel free to share this information, share this presentation with others uh, and looking forward to working with you all. Thank you.